Welcome to Chemistry Matters. What is equilibrium? Most of us think of equilibrium as a state that occurs when two things are equal in some way, or when some type of balance is achieved between two things. Scientifically speaking, equilibrium is a condition in which all acting influences are canceled by others, resulting in a stable, balanced, or unchanging system. So any system at equilibrium will be stable, balanced, or unchanging. Remember those three words. They're key to understanding equilibrium. With that in mind, let's get out to our classroom to learn a little more. You might be asking yourself, what exactly is it that's balanced in equilibrium? And actually what's balanced or equal depends on the type of equilibrium that we're talking about. And we'll look at chemical equilibrium in a moment, but first let's explore equilibrium in general. So take a look at these three images on the monitor, and which of these do you think represent equilibrium? Well, the rocks in the first picture are balanced, so that's gotta be equilibrium. Great, and you actually use one of our three key words, stable, balanced, or unchanging. So what do the rest of you think? Do you agree that the rocks represent equilibrium? And how about the other images? I think the rocks are in equilibrium too, but I don't think the balls and water are since they're moving. Yes, the balls and water are moving. So you think that something that's moving can't be in equilibrium? What about when you run on a treadmill? You're moving, but you're not actually going anywhere. So that's equilibrium. Good point. So let's take a look at the images again and see if any of the three key words, stable, balanced, and unchanging, can be used to describe them. And Josh already noticed that the rocks are balanced. How about the balls in the water? The balls don't seem balanced or stable or unchanging, but I guess the amount of water does stay the same. Does that mean it's in equilibrium? It sure does. And that's a good job working that one out. So let's talk about the balls being juggled. What do the rest of you think? Can you find anything that's balanced, stable, or unchanging about them? The balls are moving, but they're not really changing. Their pattern doesn't change. That's a great description, okay? Because the balls travel in a certain path, and as long as something doesn't interfere with that path, it's unchanging. And as a matter of fact, all three of the images represent systems at equilibrium. As you saw in that first image, the rocks are balanced. The weight or force of the rocks on top is about equal. That gives us a stable, balanced, and unchanging system. And just like our students noticed, the rocks aren't moving. This picture is an example of a static equilibrium, a state of equilibrium in which no movement occurs. In the other images, we see a dynamic equilibrium, a state of equilibrium in which two opposing processes occur simultaneously with no net change. The balls are in constant motion, as is the water, but there's no net change in either of these systems. And even though water is flowing, the water level stays the same. The balls in the picture are in constant motion. In order to juggle, one hand has to catch the balls at the same speed that the other hand releases them. The balls are in equilibrium as long as the rates of incoming and outgoing balls are equal. I'm going to attempt to reach dynamic equilibrium with these bags. If I keep them on the same path at the same speed, equilibrium will be in effect. <laughs> as you can see, when things change, we don't have a very stable system or in this case, a very good juggler. The water level in our image stays the same, even though there's a constant flow of water in and out of the container. In order for the water level to remain stable or unchanging, the rate at which water is added to the container must equal the rate at which water is removed. The water is in equilibrium as long as the rates of incoming and outgoing water flow are equal. Now that we have a better understanding of equilibrium in general, Let's talk about chemical equilibrium. We'll be looking at chemical systems instead of rocks and balls, but these systems still have to be balanced, stable, or unchanging to be in equilibrium. One other characteristic you should know about chemical equilibrium is that it's always dynamic, which means that there's constant activity and change. But what does it mean when a chemical reaction reaches a state of equilibrium? What could be stable, balanced, or unchanging in a chemical reaction at equilibrium? Let's go back to our classroom to find out. Chemists describe equilibrium as a state that's reached when the rate of the forward reaction equals the rate of the reverse reaction, 
Or in other words, the rate that the products are being created is the same as the rate of the products turning back into reactants. And we can tell the reaction has reached equilibrium when the amounts of the reactants and products remain constant or unchanging. So let's pair up for a brief activity that will help us visualize equilibrium. Both teams have a box containing two colors of Legos. And the objective of this activity is to determine how the relative rates of the forward and the reverse reactions affect equilibrium. And we'll monitor the change in the number of the reactants and products over time to estimate the rates of the forward and the reverse reactions. And so each individual Lego piece represents a chemical reactant. Each connected Lego piece represents a product. And when I start the timer, one person in each group will reach into the box without looking and remove two Lego pieces. If the two pieces are different colors and they are unconnected, then that person will connect the two Legos to form a product and then return it immediately to the box. If the two pieces are the same color or one of them is a product that's already connected to another piece, they'll immediately return them to the box without changing them. This person will represent the forward reaction. The other team member will reach into the box without looking and remove one Lego. If the Lego removed is a product, which is, remember, two pieces that are already connected, then they'll take apart the product, and that will represent reforming the reactants. If the Lego removed is a single piece, they'll immediately return it to the box. This person is going to represent the reverse reaction. And so I'll reach over, and I'll shake the box of Legos, and that's going to represent the kinetic energy of the system. How long do we do this? That's a good question. You'll connect and disconnect Legos for one minute at a time. And I'll tell you when to start and stop, and then we'll count how many reactants and products are formed after each minute. Now, after one minute, we'll check to see if the reaction has reached equilibrium. How will we know if our reactions reached equal equilibrium? That's when the rates of the forward and reverse reactions are the same, right? Exactly. But how are we going to know that the rates are the same? Let me give you a hint. If the forward and reverse reactions are happening at the same rate, how will the amount of reactants and products change? That's a trick question. If we're going at the same rate, the amount won't change at all. Good. And that's exactly how we'll know that we are at equilibrium. The amount of the reactants and products are going to remain constant. So are there any other questions? I'm the reverse reaction, so I'm supposed to take products apart. But there won't be anything to take apart in the beginning. That's true. And that's actually exactly what happens when a chemical reaction first begins. Because until we have products and they've had a chance to build up, the reverse reaction can't occur, or it happens very slowly. So the partners in each group that are representing the reverse reactions probably won't pull apart any Legos until the forward reaction has at least made a few products. So would anyone like to make a prediction about how many reactants and products we'll have once we reach equilibrium? I think it'll be half reactants and half products. So why do you think that, Josh? Well, if the products and the reactants are both reacting at the same rate, the amount should end up at the same, right? Well, if, if both the forward and the reverse reactions started off at the same rate, then you'd be right. There'd be equal amounts of reactants and products. But do the rates of the reverse and forward reactions start out at the same rate? No, not even close. The forward reaction is a lot faster than the reverse reaction in the beginning. So I really don't know how many reactants and products will be at equilibrium. I guess it depends on how fast we connect and disconnect the Legos. That is absolutely right, Danica. So let's get started with our activity. And I'd like you to try to go at a steady pace, OK? In other words, let's try to keep the rate of the Lego reactions as constant as possible. This is not a race. And you'll begin assembling and disassembling as soon as I say go. And I'll tell you to stop after one minute. And at that point, we'll count how many reactants and products we have. OK, ready, set, go. Kinetic energy. Kinetic energy. OK, stop and count how many reactants and how many products you have. I'll record the results so that we can keep track of the changes in our numbers over time. Looks like we've got two products and 13 of each of the reactants. Looks like we got three products and 12 of each reactant. Looks like we're faster than the other group. That's just because our reverse reaction was faster than yours. 
interesting results. Let's see what happens if we continue the forward and the reverse reactions for another minute. Ready? Go. Energy. Okay, stop, another minute is up. So count your reactants and products for me and I'll record it on the board for us. All right, it looks like we got three products and 12 reactants. And we're up to four products and 11 reactants. Okay, let's look at this data and see if we can draw any conclusions from it. Do you guys notice any trends in the data? The products are increasing. Slowly. Good, very good. Is there anything else that you see? Our forward reaction, it's still slightly faster than theirs, but not by much. Or maybe our forward reaction went the same rate, but your reverse reaction was slower. That's right. The rates of both the forward and the reverse reaction are gonna determine how many products we have. You also might have noticed that the amount of products continues to increase, and the rate of the increase is less this time. Can anybody explain why that happened? I think I know. Our number of products increased by three in the first minute, but only by one in the second minute. I think that's because there are fewer reactants as more time goes by. Yeah, it just takes longer to form products when there's fewer reactants. That's exactly right. The rate of the reaction will decrease over time as the concentration of the reactants decreases. Let's see if this trend continues. We'll run the experiment for another minute, okay? Ready, begin. Okay, stop, time is up. So count your reactants and products again, please, and we'll record them on the whiteboard. We got four products and 11 reactants again. That's exactly what we got too. Why isn't the amount of our products increasing anymore? That's a good question. Can anybody answer that? That means your forward and reverse rates are the same. That's equilibrium, right? We reached equilibrium. Very good, we're there. You guys have reached equilibrium. And how did our data tell you that we had reached equilibrium? When the amount of reactants and products doesn't change anymore, the reaction has reached equilibrium. That's right. So do you remember our video of the water in the juggler earlier? Equilibrium occurs when the rates of the forward and the reverse reactions equal each other. And so there's no further change in the concentrations or the reactants once we get to that condition. Let's look at a graphical representation of a reaction reaching equilibrium. So if you, as you look over the graph, tell me one trend that you observe. The product AB increases in concentration until about 60 seconds, and then it levels out. And the concentration of the reactants a and B decreases until about 60 seconds, and then it stays the same too. Very good observation. So what is so special about 60 seconds? The reactant and product concentrations don't change anymore, like what happened with our Legos. That's equilibrium. Good job, okay? That's one way that we can reach or show equilibrium graphically. When there's no further change in the concentration of the reactants or the products, we said we have reached equilibrium. So let's take a minute to review what we've learned so far. So Austin, can you tell me one thing that you've learned regarding chemical equilibrium? It's dynamic. The reaction doesn't ever stop, even at equilibrium. Yes, it is. Chemical equilibrium is always dynamic. Who else could add something to that? The amount of products and reactants don't change at equilibrium. Okay, good. Anything else? The forward and reverse reactions have the same rate at equilibrium. Very good. Anyone have any questions? I've got one. What if a chemist wants to convert all the reactants to products like of an important medicine, but can't because the reactions reach equilibrium? That's a good question, and one that chemists want to ask before they run a reaction. So I thought I'd jump in here to answer it. Equilibrium does determine how much product can be made under a certain set of conditions. Fortunately, chemists can change the conditions, such as temperature, pressure, or concentration, to create more products or break the product back into reactants.
But before we talk about how we can maximize the formation of products, we'll need to understand what determines the ratio of products to reactants in a chemical reaction. The ratio of products to reactants at equilibrium depends in part on the ratio of the activation energies for the forward and reverse reactions. Activation energy refers to the minimum amount of energy needed to activate molecules to undergo a chemical reaction. The higher the activation energy needed, the slower the reaction will go. The lower the activation energy that's necessary, the faster the reaction will go. Look at this image of a man rolling a boulder up a hill. That hill represents the activation energy required to initiate the forward reaction. If we had an equal number of boulders and people on both sides of the hill trying to roll the boulders to the other side, we'd expect more boulders to collect on the right because it takes less energy to move the boulders over the shorter distance. That's also a good analogy with chemical reactions. If this hill represents the energy needed for a chemical reaction and the hill is small or only a little energy is needed, we can expect more products than reactants at equilibrium. To demonstrate what I mean, let's go back to our classroom and look at an actual energy diagram for a chemical reaction. Look at this diagram and tell me which process has a higher activation energy, the forward reaction or the reverse reaction? Well, the reactants need less energy to get over the hill than the products, so the reverse reaction would have a higher activation energy. That's exactly right. The reactants need less energy to reach the activated complex or the transition state than the products do. So Austin, which reaction do you think would happen faster? Would it be the forward reaction or the reverse reaction? The forward reaction will go faster because it takes less energy to get started. So there's going to be a lot more products at equilibrium. OK, that's good reasoning. The reactants will convert to products more quickly then the products would convert to reactants. But the ratio of the products to the reactants at equilibrium depends not only on the activation energies of the forward and reverse reaction, but also on temperature. So as temperature increases, the difference in activation energy becomes less important. And the reverse reaction will be able to compete better with the forward reaction. That just about does it for our introduction to equilibrium video the first video on our Unit 10 playlist. And the even better news is that now we're ready to explore quantitative aspects of equilibrium, like how to calculate equilibrium constants and concentrations of reactants and products at equilibrium. To do that, check out the next video on the playlist, Equilibrium Constants and Concentrations. And I'll see you there.